never come out to such cool music. I'd like to, though. I should bring that home every time before I preach. Ladies and gentlemen. All right. Anyhow, my name is Jay Baker, and I'm a pastor of a church called Revolution. And we meet in Brooklyn in a little, little place, a bar in Brooklyn called Pete's Candy Store. So that's the novelty. Oh, and I'm Jim and Tammy Faye's kid. There's the novelty. We'll get that out of the way. Some of you may have seen in the booklet that it said I reach punks and skaters. I haven't done that specifically much lately, but when we started 14 years ago, we realized that there were people who didn't have a place to go people that the church were kind of leaving out and so we opened the doors and we tried to make a church specifically for those type of people the outcast but what we started to realize over the years is that it's not just kids with tattoos or skateboarders or even teenagers but there's a lot of people who feel outcasted matter of fact I'm sure every one of us at one time or the other have felt like we did not belong so that's what revolution is really about about showing these people the love and grace of Christ we meet in a bar because it's the great middle place we they don't have to come and walk to our church and feel uncomfortable in our building Wow, I'm really going bald aren't I no you guys aren't laughing the other rabbi is just too funny a rabbi a Muslim and a punk rock preacher come into a room um, tough crowd um, but showing, showing people grace, love, and compassion is, is what I felt like we needed to do. When I saw my parents as a young man, when I grew up, I saw my parents go through rejection, through uh, humiliation from other Christians. You know, ch the church is known as the only army that shoots its wounded. Isn't that sad? And so I felt that there needed to be a change. And little did I know that the change was up in front of me the whole time in the Bible. The Bible can be a very dangerous thing if you read it in, to, in its context. If you look at the Greek and you look at the Hebrew and you start to see why it was written and whom it was written to, it's a very revolutionary book. I think a lot of the people that we've seen who were really angry at Christianity or religion, I understand but I think the religion they're angry with is a sixth grade understanding of Christianity. The more I studied Christianity, the more I studied the Bible, I realized God loved me no matter who I was or what I had done. That I was completely accepted by God. Nothing could change that. No good works, no bad works. God loved me, period. Changed my life forever. All I wanted to do was tell people about it. And that's what I've been trying to do for the past 14 years of my life. But as I've grown, I've met different challenges and different obstacles. One of the latest ones I had was I came to start thinking about the gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender community and what to do. I had so many friends who felt so hurt and destroyed by the church. What to do? Study? Okay. I started to study and I started to pray. And as I studied, I started to see that in, in a couple of the scriptures, it was the word that what they're referring to is worship to other gods and male prostitution. And that we actually added the word homosexual in the 30s late 30s, 1930s. A lot of you maybe go to a church that says homosexuality is a sin, no ifs, ands, and buts. And you may be comfortable in that, but I ask you to get out of your comfort zone and take a second look. It doesn't matter what your preacher or your priest tells you or what the majority thinks. It's what God is saying to us, what God is speaking to your heart. But I think if today the church had had to make a decision like they did when with 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 accepting the gentiles i don't know if we would do it i don't know if we would recognize jesus because jesus sat 
with people who are considered unpure and unclean, ceremonially unclean. They did not meet the purity code. And that's who Jesus hung out with, prostitutes, tax collectors, these folks. And then what do we tell people? Don't go to bars. Don't go to these places. Don't associate with such people. And we tell someone the opposite of Christ. Paul says God loves you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. All sin, all fall short, but God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. But why do we treat each other guilty? In Corinthians, love keeps no record of when it's been wronged. But it seems Christians are the best people at keeping records of when we've been wronged and when people have made a mistake. For me, the message of grace, God's unconditional love for all of us, is what drives me to wake up every day. When I decided that I didn't feel like it was, it, I didn't decide it, when I felt like I saw it in the word that it wasn't a sin, that homosexuality as I know it and understand it of two people who love each other and care about each other and committed each other wasn't a sin, that was a conviction that came from lots of studying, lots of prayer. And I knew I had to count the cost when I made it. And the cost was lose your influence, lose your financial support, and lose all your favorite speaking engagements. And it all happened. I had to let my whole staff go the week next week. All the money stopped, all the speaking engagements got canceled, and people were done. Because this is one part of theology that people will not talk about and will not tolerate. But what we're doing is we're using God to discriminate against people. We're using God to discriminate against civil rights, which really angers me. Because one person can say that civil rights is about the color of your skin, but not the way you were born and who you love. But civil rights is civil. The same rights as all. And unfortunately, we don't have those. And we don't see those. So one of the things that I try to do as a Christian leader is I try to meet with different ministers and Christians all over the world and challenge them to take a second look at that. Because our gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles and parents are slowly dying and being chased out of the church. And that time must stop now. Now I'll do a lighter note. I kept thinking about that train thing. You know when they had the debate? Yes? I'm going to need some verbalists. Yes? See? Oh, I forgot. I've got to wait for the translator. And the, the, the thing was is, okay, there's a train coming into the station, right? And there's five people on the tracks. So let me correct me if I get this wrong. And then there's another person standing up on the platform. I live in New York, so we're familiar with that. Here comes the train. Then you're here, and there's that person on the platform. What do you do? Do you push that person off? and let that person die to save the five, or do you let the five to die? And so I kept thinking about this as they were debating. I mean, it kind of just like, I was like, oh, what an interesting idea. And then one of the gentlemen, who I don't see here, but I saw him earlier today, asked, what's the Christian response to that? And the first thing that came to my mind, not necessarily what maybe my response, but the first thing that came to my mind was, I would jump in front of the train. I don't know if that was an option, but it, to me it is. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. said, if a man hasn't discovered something he will die for, he isn't fit to live. And I think what he means is, is when we don't have something we're willing to die for, we lose passion. Something amazing has happened in the United States recently. And it all started with a Baptist minister who became a Baptist minister because his father was a Baptist minister. And his father was a minister. And his father was a minister. And they read the Bible. They prayed. They followed in family tradition. But one of these young men, Martin Luther King Jr., decided... This isn't God. The way people are being treated is not Christian. It's not the right way. Something is terribly wrong and terribly dangerous. And so what we have here is 
a man who took a stand that was not popular. You know, rocks being thrown in through a window, crosses being burnt in front of his home. His very good friends would go on walks and be shot and murdered. You know, the really sad thing is, is, is really until the white people got involved and started getting killed, not a whole lot of people were paying attention. But Martin Luther continued. Martin Luther King continued to march forward. And he gave his life. He gave his life because he, he believed in a dream. But it wasn't just a dream about African-American rights. It was a dream for all people. He was working on a on a pro, uh, he was working on poverty for white, brown, black, red, purple, and green, and that's when his life was taken because he believed in something, you know. And that's what wakes me up every day is knowing that forty years later, after this man was killed for what he believed, the United States has a black president. Because a Baptist minister decided to be obedient to his calling of God. Because what some people would say, well, you just followed in a comfortable tradition and you did what your grandfather did and your father did. But no, he fell into something. He went into it with passion and purpose that was his own. And now America is a different country because of that. So if we want to talk about all the bad things about religion, let's start talking about the good things. Martin Luther King made Barack Obama possible a Baptist minister come on we can tear Christianity apart but you know what to some of those who don't want to deal with any type of faith use some of the positive things that'll make your argument better do you know that Christianity the first 248 years actually I wrote it down I want, I want to have this factual for you so I know people will go over it and look over it for the first 284 years of Christianity, it remained an anti-war, some called a cult. Christians would not serve in the war. They would not fight in the war. They would not participate in the war. What eventually happened is we had someone like Constantine who came along and said, God told me to go to war. Get mad at Constantine. You know, you're mad. Jesus has a crappy fan club. No kidding. Religious people can be closed-minded. No kidding. Tell me something I don't know. But is it an argument to snuff the whole thing out? Mm, I don't think so, but at the same time, I really don't care because it doesn't affect me. When I saw the argument happening here, I agreed with this side a little bit and agreed with this side a little bit. But you know what I thought? This has got no relevance to me anymore. As we talk about the future of faith, I said, these two are already emerging in Christian culture right now and in secular culture. We're learning to love each other and respect each other and work together. So I kind of felt like the debate was kind of the old guard. No offense to the debaters. I'm just a, maybe a little bit younger and naive, who knows. Yes, thank you. I, I did think John Esposito was pretty awesome, though. I, okay, I'm going to give a little prop there. I thought he... I like the future of religion when I see someone like that. But I don't think the future of religion relies in hate or intolerance or I believe it, you know, the idea of Christianity is changing. When you ask young Christians now why they're voting, it's not about abortion or gay rights or not having or excluding gays. They talk about the environment. I mean, I've got such an environmentally concerned church. I mean, they drive me nuts. They don't, half of them don't eat meat try to convince me not to eat meat but every time I try to not eat meat I eat too many french fries and I just I get fat so it's my vanity that keeps me from going vegetarian they're worried about Darfur they're worried about human rights I mean there are good people out there who are concerned with Africa it's so funny I was thinking like 20 years ago it would have been all the religious people running up on the stage during a debate and now all the scientists are running up on the stage about the debate it's like the fundamentals have, have somehow changed. But I don't think we need to argue and fight. I mean, we can talk and argue and we can have debates. I mean, they're, they're healthy. Everybody was hugging and loving each other afterwards. It was a love fest. Um, but I just don't see these harsh right or left wing things 
being the, the, the new future. I don't see Jerry Falwell's idea of religion being the future, and I don't see Richard Dawkins' idea of being the future. And both those men are fundamentalists, whether you like it or not. I've met them both and spoke with them both. Jerry has since passed. So what do you guys think? So far, so good? So let's look at this. 284 years of Christians remained anti-war until government got involved, corruption got involved, people started seeing God as a God of war, and compromise happened. People compromise, whether it be Christian, Jew, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, Sikh, sometimes we compromise. Unfortunately, what's happened with Christianity's compromises, such as, as things that happened with August, uh, with, with uh, Constantine, and things that have happened over the years have been really sad to me. To see people killed in the name of Christ when really it wasn't even about that is, 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 is sad to me. To see people driven to suicide because of Jesus is really sad to me. The reality is gay and lesbians do kill themselves because they feel rejected from the church. There's a, you know, a whole gay denomination called MCC, and it started because they were so pushed away. They just wanted to worship God. But we, somehow, who got a free gift called grace, don't want to give it to anybody else. I thought Jesus said, stop judging. How you judge, you will be judged, so stop it. Stop criticizing one another. Remember, Paul said, be careful of biting and devouring one another. How will they know that you belong to me? See, what I feel like is, I, is almost like, you know, Christianity con needs a continuous reformation. Spirituality needs a continuous reformation. And we need to check. We need to keep a check on ourselves. See what we're doing. See what we're thinking. But there's a way to really see, as far as Christians are concerned, if they, you know, if they're really following things. Christians, you know, aren't perfect and all that stuff. But to really fail if they're following God's purpose, if they're really following after Christ and what God's called them. One, Jesus said that they will know you belong to me for your love for one another. So when you see Christians not loving one another, you know that maybe they're missing the point somewhere along the line. Another thing is that you'll know them by their fruits. Now, a tree does not eat its own fruit. Fruits are for other people to eat. So, if you're around people who give you peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and most of all, love and joy, then you might be experiencing a follower of Christ. But, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians in my country don't read their Bibles. A lot of Catholics don't read their Bibles. And so when it comes to talking about Christianity, we don't know what to say. It's the greatest story never told. We don't know how to communicate what we believe. I don't know how we dedicate our whole lives to serving a God that we don't even know when we have information to understand and look. And we have historical background, we have research, we have books that allow us and computers that can help us with Greek and Hebrew and know why these, why these books were written and to whom they were written. But instead we go in and just say, okay, I'll accept it. This is wrong and this is right and I'm gonna do it. Do you know that we didn't meet on Sundays originally? That was a Constantine idea because he liked the sun god. December 25th, the birth of the sun god. Constantine again. Your sacred, ho sacred holidays, man-made by a pagan. Parts of, parts of uh, half, uh, about three of Paul's writings we know definitely weren't written by him. You know, the virgin bear birth narrative sounds a little close to what, to Moses' narrative? Now these are things to look at and ask. Don't allow yourself and your faith to be built on a house of cards. 
You know, don't just listen and do what because someone says it. It's like you're having someone else chew your food for you. To me, real faith, real my 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 real experience with Jesus has allowed me to love people and respect people. It has made me to to take a second look and think on the ideas of hell is that wow, we we've got most of this from Dante. We've created something else. You know, hell is translated in some places as southwest of Jerusalem. So we can go visit hell if we want. And I don't know why we're so eager to want to push people into a fiery pit. I mean, that doesn't seem like the love and compassion of Christ. If it doesn't make sense, look at it closer. There's historical books. There's books written to understand. There's, there's all sorts of information that you can get to become a deeper, have a deeper relationship with God and to have a deeper understanding of the Bible and to understand that it didn't just stop there, but faith continues to grow and continues to live. Now, I know I've preached you all for the past 21 minutes and I said I wasn't gonna do that, but that's what I did. I have love for my atheist friends and my believing friends, my friends of all faith. I think God is much bigger than we let him let on to. I live in New York, and if you walk down the street, if, if we've made God as small as we've made him, the majority of my street would be hellbound. One second. <laughs> Everybody's going long today. You should have known the religious people go long. Um, and we don't respect boundaries. Um, no? Okay. But, but the fact is, is that I don't know what my fact was anymore because you stood up and made me lose it. Time concern. Now you cost you more time. I, I guess the idea is that I've realized that God loves us all very much. And God is an inclusive God. And I know that Jesus wasn't killed for being exclusive. Jesus was crucified for being inclusive. He loved all the wrong people. And that's what I want to do. I want to love all the wrong people because I wanna be like Christ. I wanna be like Martin Luther King Jr. who knew that civil rights was so important that it was worth dying for and he didn't even really, he said, you know, I'm probably gonna not make it there with you, but that's okay. I've seen the promised land. And so what I see in my faith has brought me a vision for seeing the promised land for my LGBT friends, for my friends who are hurting in pain and for all my friends of other religions that we can unite, that we can talk to each other, and that we can keep our traditions and our customs. But at the same time, we've got to check, is it got compassion? When Jesus had problem with religious leaders, it wasn't the fact that it was all the law, it was the fact that they didn't have compassion to go along with it. And the Bible says, be compassionate as God is compassionate. And compassion in the Greek and in the Hebrew is from the bowels, where you feel others' pains from your entrails, and you women, from your womb, you feel and other hurts and pains. And when you feel that type of hurt and pain and share that with other people, you're not gonna turn someone from your church. You're not gonna point a finger. You're gonna follow the golden rule. You're gonna do unto others as you would like them to do to you. So just hate others how you wanna be hated. Gossip about others how you'd wanna be gossiped. Kill others how you'd wanna be killed. And live by that mantra. Give it a day. The next few days, just try to live by the golden rule. See what happens in your life. God will show up. Compassion will be there. And you will realize what love is. Thank you.